Thank you. So the idea, uh, the idea behind this book, The Jazz Ear, is um, just came through the practice of interviewing musicians and doing it in different ways and, and, and figuring out how I could get the most out of them and the most um, kind of the deepest um, musical ideas. And um, I started doing this thing where, you know, often when you're with a musician, inevitably you might end up uh, listening to, to music if there's any around. You know, if there's any, if there's if there's a CD player and if there's something you're both talking about, you want you want to hear it, you want to demonstrate what it is you're talking about. Um, but I started doing that on purpose, um, asking musicians to. Um, to play me some some kinds of music that they felt very close to, not like you know my my life story as told through the records that I that I heard as I was growing up, not necessarily that, but just music that they felt close to, and we would talk over the music together, and I wanted to find out how they heard and what they listened for, and hearing music animates musicians obviously, so. I did this in a bunch of articles for the newspaper. We turned these pieces into a book, and since the book has come out, we've been doing exactly that uh, in front of audiences. So tonight I'm really pleased to do this with George Garzon, and thank you so much for being here for this. Um, I asked George what he wanted to listen to, and uh, he came up with four pieces of music that are that, that happened in, in, uh, in a block of time between 1962 and 1965, um, when you were a teenager. You're from Boston, yes. and uh, you were born in 1950. So you started playing at six, is, is that right? I was actually nine, uh, and I, I come from a family of saxophone players. We all grew up in Rossendale, which is by Jamaica. My uncle Rocco taught all of us, my cousin Richie and myself, and the sound that I have is actually a family given sound yeah. that was kind of bestowed and handed down yeah. from him. Yeah. But um, what was it, was it uh, when you got into your teenage years, you were actually, were you more curious about specific players? You were, you were hearing more specific records, you were kind of getting an idea of where you wanted to go? Well, at age 11 or 12, my uncle Frank, who was Rocco's brother, uh, gave me Sonny Meets Hawk and Stan Gets Reflections. And I didn't realize while I was listening to these records and playing along with Stan that I was kind of morphing his sound. So I just assumed that these were the people to listen to, but they had already they knew that this sound was a specific sound that they wanted me to have. Uh -huh. you know, they related, I think, music, which was great, and I'm trying to do that with my students. They related everything to the ear, rather than, you know, you should do this or should, you should do that. Whatever pleased their ear, they turned us on to that. So, Sonny Rollins, Coleman Hawkins, <coughs> Stan Getz, all had a kind of natural broad sound that they thought of as a kind of ideal right. and something worth looking into. Right. Uh, it wasn't until I went to Berkeley in 68 that I started to find out about people like Coltrane and um, you know, all of the heavier players that had more specific aggressive sounds. Like right. Roland Kirk. And, uh, more of the heavier guys that <clears throat> were playing tennis saxophone. But in those in the younger years, it was great for me to, to understand what a good sound was about because it was, I, I felt that that was the foundation for me to be able to understand everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we hear this piece from, from the Sonny Rollins and, and Colin Hawkins record? This is uh, the one record they, they made together in 1963. And um, kind of a father-son thing going on here. Rollins was 33, and, and Coleman Hawkins was 58. And um, 
and Coleman Hawkins was Sonny Rollins' idol. At the same time, Sonny Rollins was very consciously aware that it was time to change a lot of things in jazz, and he couldn't just continue on, you know, continue doing what people were doing in the in the 40s or even the 50s. And some of the choices that Sonny Rollins makes on this record are very, they're almost aggressive in kind of talking back to the, to the master. Um, but as you were saying, there's something about it where, where they start to sound like each other. Not just the, the younger one emulating the older one, but, but vice versa. So, um, this is, it's a fascinating record. Actually, Pat Matheny, when I talked to him for this book, chose something from the same record. But this is a different track. This is uh, Lover Man. <laughs> 